Amanda. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Christianity? I'm really well today, thank you, and I'm um, looking forward to talking about this topic of anxiety and trauma. We've had a few anxious moments trying to get this uh, recording done, haven't we? <laughs> we have, and looking at the calendar, this episode is actually going to be airing on one of the days of the year that it has the highest level of anxiety attacks, which is actually USA's Thanksgiving Day. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, Maybe we can talk more about that as we go. Yeah. Yeah. It's been <laughs> kind of weird trying to get together just to make this one happen. And a lot of people don't realize this since our podcast airs every two weeks without fail that sometimes we try to record every single week, but every now and then we just get a little behind and things get a little anxious for us because we're like, we got to get this done. But as anybody can see, you have a brand new headset. So we've had some audio stuff going on. My microphone went out. We've had personal stuff come up in our lives. It's been a wild ride. It has been a wild ride and I'm glad we're finally here and we are recording. Yay! <laughs> And we also have these brand new schnazzy backgrounds and we're, this is our first ever video podcast. Yeah, it is actually, isn't it? That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is the one. So people can see that we have our brand new branded backgrounds here. Mine has my name on it. Yours has your name on it over there. Yeah. I'm just it's pointing so cool. in every direction because I don't know which way it's going to look for them <laughs> to be over here. <laughs> Oh, okay. I think we need to start getting serious. So um, today's topic is about anxiety and trauma. So I was hoping that you'd start us off by just explaining to everybody what that means. What is anxiety in relation to trauma? So anxiety attacks um, tend to occur in a response to stressors. So things like um, trauma triggers. They can build up gradually and panic attacks can occur completely unexpectedly and abruptly. Um, and while this can indicate some kind of an underlying health condition, what we're talking about today is specifically panic attacks as they relate to um, PTSD and trauma. Mm. So, I mean, mm. you hear people talk about panic attacks all the time. This is really, really common. A lot of people bring it up and, oh my gosh, I have anxiety and I've got depression. And I want to say first, very clearly that if you believe you have anxiety and depression, talk to somebody about it, mm -hmm. get medically diagnosed. You don't want to go around diagnosing yourself because we can end up putting chemicals and substances in our bodies to counteract these things that we don't actually need. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I thought I might add in there is that with traumatic events, they actually um, can change the way our brain works and therefore we can become more susceptible to anxiety attacks as a result of traumatic events. So, uh, yeah, just thought I'd add that one in. And there's a Next few different... Yeah. There's a few different con conditions. So when it comes to anxiety attacks too, so there's a couple of different things that we can look at. Uh, there's of course the generalized anxiety disorder. There's also uh, a separation anxiety disorder. And what most people don't know is that agoraphobia is considered an anxiety disorder too. You know, mm. this is somebody with agoraphobia who does not have a panic disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder can often have panic attacks. Um, they don't have to have an outside trauma. They've already got internal trauma from experiencing this fear. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. So um, one of the next questions I had for you is how does it actually manifest? Like what, what, can we experience um, within ourselves when we're experiencing a trauma, uh, sorry, a, a traumatic anxiety attack? The first one I'm going to very clear. <laughs> the first one I'm going to bring up is one I am personally incredibly guilty of: not answering the phone or avoiding making calls. Mm. 
Mm. I hate talking on the phone and I do have an incredible amount of anxiety that's built up around this. Not only did I get in trouble as a child for being on the phone too long or having phone conversations, but people would listen in on my phone conversations. My family would bully me and pick on me for whatever was said during these private phone conversations. Um, I ended up working as a telemarketer for a little while. So that coupled with the early childhood stuff Mm. about being on the phone, I don't like being on the phone anymore. It's like one of the worst things in the world for me. Another sign is when you find yourself shutting down or being really silent during group events or social settings. And I found myself doing that at an event I went to this past Thursday. And I pulled myself aside and said, self, you need to not do that. You're here at this specific event because you know that you need to talk to these people get out there and go talk to them. So you can Mm -hmm. counteract this stuff when you're noticing it, but you have to recognize it as being a problem first. You could also find yourself being really nervous or uncomfortable when someone sits too close to you. I'm guilty Mm -hmm. of that one too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You can find the, that you need to sit in a certain place or area of a restaurant. So to put that in context, if you refuse to sit with your back to the door, Mm -hmm. This is an anxiety sign. Yes. It's the same thing with needing to sit near an exit if you're at a social event or staying near the exit or staying near the food. I'm also guilty of that. Food is a comfort. We reach for food when we don't know what else to do with our hands and mouths. Mm -hmm. We're in this great big, huge setting. We've got all these people that are talking and wanting to interact with each other. I'm stuffing my face. (laughs) It's terrible. Um, Overeating and overdrinking is also, uh, both of those things are signs of anxiety attacks or anxiety in general. And I'm really bad about those too. Becoming instantly nervous when someone is knocking at your door, uh, when you're not expecting Mm -hmm. them or they're not invited over. Oh, absolutely. Pretty much every single person that I know knows not to come to my house unless I'm expecting them. Yeah. And constantly apologizing for things that aren't even your fault. This is a huge red flag for anxiety too. Um, and this one falls under hypervigilance, but also it is a sign of anxiety when you have a mm. heightened startle reflex. Mm. Mm. People that are hypervigilant, they jump, you know, you know, easily startled. That is a sign of anxiety. Not yeah. wanting to have people over to your house because you can't control when they do or do not leave. This is a sign of anxiety. If you think about it and you're like, I don't want them to come over because I have no idea how long they're going to stay and how do I kick them out? And I don't know how to tell them no. This couples well with not having healthy boundaries. And being more comfortable around certain people than others. Let's say you and I are in a room. I'd be just fine hanging out with you. Put me in a room with somebody I don't know as well. Mm. I want to leave. Mm. I'm I'm mm. done here. I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> so I do. I still have a lot of signs of anxiety. Thankfully, they are somewhat controlled because I have done enough research into them at this point that I can recognize them when they start coming up. And I, I understand that this is something that I need to fight back against and really combat to kind of retrain my brain. But I mean, with this episode specifically airing on Thanksgiving here in the USA, it's also really important to recognize that pretty much every single one of those things that I just mentioned are going to be coming up for somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the really important things is that um, for listeners to understand is that you've been able to identify these things within yourself. So hopefully just by raising these uh, points, people would be able to identify those things within themselves and be able to do something about it. Like, like you said, you, you took yourself aside for a moment and had a serious chat to yourself about (laughs) um, getting back in that room and interacting with people, you know, Um, and it's finding those little tools and strategies that actually help us all individually because we all deal with things in a different way. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just take yourself aside and say self. (laughs) And remember that it is okay to have those healthy boundaries. If you're one of those people where 
you feel really uncomfortable when this person is sitting too close to you. Mm. You're, it's okay for you to get up and move. Mm-hmm. Don't huff and puff about it because they're not going to have any idea what's wrong with you because they just took a seat. <laughs> or you can actually, you know, communicate with them. Use the three standard filters that I ta- constantly talk about. Is it kind? Is it true? And is it necessary? It is necessary because you're feeling very uncomfortable. This is a boundary for you. Is it kind? It might not be kind, but put, make it as kind as possible. And is it true? Yes, it's absolutely true that you're experiencing some anxiety, but still, but make it as kind as possible. And mm-hmm. you can tell that person, I'm so sorry. You know, I don't mean any offense, but I, I am kind of guarded about my personal space. I'm going to move over, but I don't want you to be offended by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's important, isn't it, to also maintain those, that social etiquette, those manners, um, and be mindful of other people. But sometimes when you're in that moment, it's very hard to think about other people. You're very caught up in how you're feeling. Right. Absolutely. um, And it comes with practice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it can take a long time to really get the kind of practice that you really need to establish what it is that you'd figure out what it is that you're needing, mm-hmm. what's going to make you more comfortable. I mean, the second point that I brought up was shutting down or being really quiet during group events or social settings. I mean, here in the U S on Thanksgiving, most people are with people like large groups of people. And if you find yourself shutting down and being really silent during these events, that's okay. But recognize that you are still in this large group setting And sometimes what you need in that moment is to step away, take a few Mm. minutes to yourself, not on your phone, put the phone down, (laughs) but step away for a couple of minutes, take a couple of deep breaths, use the five senses techniques to help yourself ground one more time and then go back into that group. Look around the room, find somebody that you know is interesting or somebody that you know you enjoy speaking to and Get yourself back into it slowly by approaching that person. Hmm. Sometimes that's all you really need. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, one of the ways that we've been talking about topics in the last, well, this last year is that we talk about the short-term and the long-term effects of um, the particular issue that's that's the topic. So in terms of the long-term consequences of, of being in this anxious state, do you want to talk a little bit about that? So some of the long-term consequences can be kind of scary. Mm. One of them is uh, probably the most extreme is agoraphobia. Mm. Now, agoraphobia, for the people that are not familiar with phobias, I have an entire book on phobias specifically, and I <laughs> talk about phobias quite often. Um Agoraphobia is this fear of leaving your home, leaving the safe environment that you're already familiar with. When you develop agoraphobia, it stops your whole life. You don't go anywhere. You don't talk to anybody. And you think at first, this is great. I can live with this. I don't mind if I never see another person again. Believe me, I'm saying all these things because I've been there and I lived there. Mm. But the truth is we are designed to have connection with other humans. We need that connection. And you and I, we live so far away that we only really have this connection virtually. You know, we yes, talk indeed. on the phones, we can have the Zoom conferences. But what it comes down to is we need another human in our life, somebody we can personally interact with. Physical touch is a huge part of the human condition. If you don't have this, you will slip into depression and worse anxiety, and you will start developing emotional avoidance and further sensitivities that you're not prepared for. You can start becoming more aggressive when things frustrate you and you start displaying a lot more of these long-term consequences from all of these other trauma reactions that we've been talking about and a whole lot more that we still have coming. Mm. agoraphobia and not dealing with anxiety attacks can leave you with severe nightmares. You're not having your brain stimulated in any way during the day. 
I know from personal experience that if your brain is not stimulated during the day by some kind of an interaction, your nightmares will take revenge on you. Yes, I've been there. (laughs) (laughs) I can relate to that one. (laughs) Oh, gee. So let's let's think about some of the immediate consequences of anxiety. Um, so you talked about how things manifest, but how does it actually impact on us? Well, with today being Thanksgiving Day, uh, anxiety to some level can prevent people from connecting with their own families. Mm. It can destroy um, your friendships and your family relationships. And this can happen as easily as in one day. It can happen today. Mm -hmm. If you tell your family, I don't feel like it, I'm not coming, they're going to be hurt. You have to have proper communication. If you decide that you're not going to go, you do have to understand that it's okay if you don't go. If you feel like you can't go, just communicate this with them. That form of communication is a form of helping to fight the anxiety, of course, too. Mm -hmm. But If you don't start trying to figure out what your anxiety is and what those uh, signals are, what those triggers are, you're going to end up standing alone in the corner uh, or not going at all to every single event moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that's not a fun place to be. You know, when I went to that event this past Thursday, I was standing there with my husband and I was eating grapes. And I was thinking to myself, I really do need to be going out there and talking to these people. And this is before I had that, that little self chat. I said self, (laughs) but I stood there for a moment and eating my grapes. And there was a couple little pieces of cheese and I'm nibbling at them because this is giving me something to do with my mouth. It's giving me something to do with my hands. And as long as I have food in my mouth, it's okay that I'm not talking to anybody because that would Mm. be considered rude. I don't want to do that. I was using the food as an excuse. And that leads to overeating. And there's all these little things that come up when it comes to being related to anxiety in this moment. You know, it can prevent you from, let's say you're single and you go to some event and there's some really cute guy sitting across the way and you really want to go and talk to this guy, but you don't because you've got anxiety. That guy might've turned out to be the love of your life. And you didn't even give him a shot. You mm-hmm. didn't try because you were afraid. It could be as something as simple as the lady sitting all the way across the room might be the person who's supposed to be your best friend and your confidant. And if you don't go and talk to somebody, you're never going to discover what an incredible human they are. Mm-hmm. So basically what you're saying is that some of the short-term consequences are that it's limiting your interactions with people and it's limiting um, your daily life. Right. And it limits you in so many crazy ways. You know, your daily life, your friends, your family. If you have anxiety so bad that you're afraid to go to a new grocery store, you're missing out on new foods. Mm -hmm. I have, I have the same grocery store I go to every single week, as weird as that sounds, because of this problem, because I still have anxiety. And you can spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy battling this, but that doesn't mean that you're going to cure it. Mm. There's no magic wand. There's no one size fits all cure. It is what it is. It exists in your life. It exists because something happened. And this is something that you're going to have to work on and you will have to work on it for the rest of your life. It does get easier. So maybe we can talk about, again, some of the ways that you can work on things that um, are constantly you're battling with. So when you have an increased startle response, that was one of the, the points that I brought up. If you're jumpy, that one is a hard one to really fight back against. That's when your nervous system is constantly uh, dysregulated. So you have this heightened response to noises or some kind of outside stimulus. uh, And other people might not be um, bothered by this at all. 
I have personally found that small bits of exposure help in tremendous ways. So there for a little while, um, I'm still working on this one, actually. I was fine with all of the music at our church for a long time. Just recently, and I think it's related to the medications, the bass drums were turned up really loud and that loud go boom when they hit the bass drum was causing me such severe panic and anxiety attacks that I would literally melt. I would just have an absolute meltdown. I shouted at my husband more than once. <laughs> I needed to get out of there. And I had to learn that I, I can't go in there for the music. Mm -hmm. I have to wait until the music ends and then I can go inside and I can go for the service. And then when the music starts up again, I leave. Yeah. But if I stay for a couple minutes or, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds after the music starts, just these little bits of exposure can help me to figure out how to deal with it. Yes. It's still causing yeah. me problems, but I'm not waiting until I get to the point of a meltdown. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of exposure. So exposure therapy has been really helpful and, you know, I discovered that because of doing this podcast with you. Fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I also want to pick up on one thing that you mentioned, and that was dysregulation of the nervous system. And that's one of the things that I've experienced a lot in my life. And one of the ways that has helped me to get my nervous system back into balance is meditation and mindfulness um, and, and using that as a daily practice so that your body finds a way to maintain that regulation on a daily basis. And, um, you know, you said it's something that you can't cure. Um, I think in time, depending on how you, you work at it, you can actually manage it really, really well so that it doesn't impact you in, a, in your daily life anymore. Right. Yeah. You can definitely make it a lot better. It's mm. never completely gone, but you can definitely help to, to regulate yeah. it, to fix it, to yeah. uh, reclaim your life from it. And just remember that it may rear its ugly head again at some point, but at that point, you've already learned so many different coping mechanisms and you recognize what it is that when it does happen again down the road, you're going to be so much better equipped to deal with it and to fight mm. it away, fight it back and, you know, push it away from you and go, no, you don't control me. You don't own me. I own me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a really great point that you raised that it's about control and feeling a lack of control for a lot of people that experience anxiety and it's about finding ways in which we can take control back over our lives. Right. We had an episode back on July 11th about the need for control, mm. you know, and we mentioned something about anxiety, even in that episode. So a lot of this stuff really does overlap. We do have this need for control and there's so little that we, we can control in our lives that when we can find something like these coping tools to be able to fight back these trauma responses, it's really important to recognize them and work at them to remember them so that we can use them. We're not going to be able to control what causes the trigger, but we can control to a degree how we react to it. Yeah, exactly. And I think Again, another great point that you've brought up, Amanda, because life happens, things happen around us, and we actually don't have any control whatsoever on what happens around us. And um, sometimes for people who experience anxiety and who've had really tr you know, trauma reactions in their lives, um, that need for stability and consistency is a, is a great need, but one of the things that we have to come to terms with is that there is no guarantees in life that everything's going to happen smoothly and more than likely it isn't. And it's our responses that are important and that, that's actually what we have control over. So learning strategies is so important. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more because you've got some really great strategies that you use on an ongoing basis. So what would you uh, recommend would be great for specifically for trauma? 
uh, for anxiety rather. Biggest one, honestly, is the five senses technique. And mm. I know we've talked about that at, a lot, but just the other day, a friend of mine on Facebook was saying that they were having a, a pretty nasty problem with their anxiety and they were trying to figure out what to do. How do I deal with this? I need to calm down. I don't get it. Why is this happening to me? And I could read right between the lines where everybody else was going, oh, just watch a funny movie. That's not going to help. That is not going to help right now. You need help right now. The best way is through the five senses technique. And for the people that aren't familiar with that, that is what are the five things that you can see? What are the four things that you can feel? Three things that you can hear? Two things that you can smell? And what's one thing that you can taste? Think about these things. Take the time to pick them out. Right now I'm tasting oranges because I had oranges right before we started because yum. <laughs> <laughs> but take the time to go through the five senses technique. This is going to help you reground yourself. Recognize that what where you are and what you're going through is not a dangerous situation. If it is a dangerous situation, get out. Call 911. Mm -hmm. No matter what. I don't care if you think this doesn't uh, sound like something I should call 911 for. If you're in a dangerous situation, it is. Um, 999 in the UK, is it the same in, in Australia? Australia is triple zero. Zero, zero, zero. I like that. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And another one of the, uh, another one of my favorite grounding techniques for when you're having anxiety attacks is deep breathing. Yeah. So some of the medications that I'm on right now, because of my whole huge laundry list of medical problems. <laughs> Some of my medications do cause uh, heart palpitations and anxiety attack. And we talked about heart palpitations back on October 31st was that episode. When this happens, take a moment to go through deep breathing exercise. For the people that aren't familiar with that one, you want to uh, think about the muscles in your body and think about how they're tense and and find somewhere free of distractions. Obviously, I'm constantly distracted, so that's not easy. Uh, sit down where you can be comfortable. Lie down if you have the option. Put one hand on your chest and one hand on your stomach. And breathe. <laughs> Take some deep breaths. We're yeah. going to have to leave it there. Thanks today. so much for a wonderful day. Uh, interaction with you about anxiety. And I hope our listeners have actually learned some really positive techniques to... Um, to deal with their own anxiety. See you next time.